Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everybody this is dr vishal trivedi from department of biosciences and bioengineering iit guwahati and uh, in in this course what we were discussing so far we were discussing about the host as well as the transforming agents and you might have seen the scheme which we are following to explain the different steps of generating our genetically modified organisms so so far what we have discussed we have discussed about the host physiology host uh, uh, ultra structures and uh, and the different types of requirement for the host to grow and how to monitor the growth as well and in the in the case of transforming agents we have discussed about the different features of different types of vectors which people are using in the bacterial expression system eukaryotic expression system such as yeast mammalian system or the bacteriophage or the uh, uh, as well as the uh, baculovirus based systems to over express or to, to generate the genetically modified organisms. So, at the end what we have generated is the transformed organism in this case we are talking about the transformed bacteria, but at the end what we have what we are going to generate by employing these kind of uh, recombinant DNA technology is we are going to generate the transformed bacteria and once you generate the transformed organisms whether it is bacteria or mammalian cells you are going to have these transformed organisms containing either the cloning vector or to the expression vector because it depends what are the questions or what are the requirement or what are the questions you would like to ask uh, from this transformed uh, host. So, in the case of cloning vector suppose you have uh, generated a recombinant clone uh, into a cloning vector, then the purpose of these uh, recombinant DNA or recombinant clone would be either to study the mechanism of transcription or to replication as well as the similar kind of strategies people are using even for generating the genomic as well as the cDNA library. So, for the so, if you are generating a recombinant clone into the cloning vector, you are actually restricting yourself to the basic research or you are using these constructs only for uh, addressing the uh, different types of uh, questions related to the processes which are happening within the cell or within the that particular host whether it is the transcription or the replication or you can use the similar kind of strategies even to generate the genomic as well as the cDNA libraries. Now, coming back to if you are generating a transformed host containing the expression vector. So, in the case of expression vector uh, you can use these uh, uh, transformed host for addressing the mechanism of translation or you can use these for protein productions. So, once you use these for protein production, this protein you can use for, for generating the antibodies or you can use this protein as an antigen to, gen, to, pre, to, uh, to prepare a uh, ELISA kit or you can generate you can use this uh, transformed host which is over expressing this particular protein for uh, regulating the metabolic processes which means ultimately what you are going to do is once you are going to use this particular protein product into the metabolic processes you are actually going to use this for 
changing the outcome in terms of the process known as fermentation. So, once you generate a recombinant transformed host and you are using a expression vector, the you are ultimately over expressing the proteins or over expressing the protein over expressing organisms and the utility of this particular thing is much more compared to that you are using this for uh, producing a recombinant clone into the cloning vectors. So, let us today we are going to discuss about how to exploit the transformed host to over express or to express the protein of your interest which you have cloned from a particular gene. So, before getting into the detail of different types of host which are important for producing the protein, let us see what are the different steps are involved in a typical protein production uh, machinery. So, in a protein production machinery you have a, a coding sequence which is called as gene and next to the gene you have a promoter sequence. This promoter sequence is required for providing the docking site for the RNA polymerase as well as different types of transcription factors and once and uh, uh, on to the uh, 3 prime end you have a termination sequence which is actually going to terminate the transcription of this particular gene. So, you can imagine that in the first step the RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter elements to start the transcription to form the messenger RNA. So, the RNA polymerase will sit on to the promoter and will start synthesis of gene and that will produce the messenger RNA. Uh, as soon as the messenger RNA will be synthesized, a translational machinery starts the synthesis of protein. In some of the eukaryotic cases, the RNA which is going to be synthesized, uh, RNA will be synthesized inside the nucleus and then this will be transported outside and that is how the transcription as well as the translation is going to be. Uh, will not going to be together. Whereas, in the case of prokaryotic system, once the gene, once the uh, messenger RNA is going to be formed, the R ribosome is going to bind to this messenger RNA when it will start the protein synthesis. Protein synthesis are usually going to start from a start codon which is mostly AUG and then it ends at the stop codon which is called as UAE, UGA or UAG. In bacteria, or the prokaryotic system, the transcription and the translation occurs simultaneously. Whereas, in the case of eukaryotic system, the transcription occurs inside the nucleus and then this, uh, uh, this messenger RNA will be transported outside into the cytosol and where the ribosome machinery will, in, will, will going to in, uh, bind to this particular messenger RNA and will synthesize the uh, protein. Uh, I, what I will suggest or I what I will uh, 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 suggest to all the student is that this is just a brief overview what is the uh, detail of the protein production machinery in any of the host, but you, you should study the different steps by going through with any of the molecular biology textbooks such as you can use the Bruce Alberts or molecular biology of the cell or you can use the uh, gene or you can use any of the standard molecular biology textbooks to understand the discrete steps of this protein production machinery to understand as well as to exploit the machinery in such a way that it should give you the better production of your protein. So, now once we have discussed this about the protein synthesis machinery, the protein synthesis machinery is present in different host and what we have discussed so far is that in the case of host cells you have the prokaryotic host cells, you have the eukaryotic host cells such as yeast, animals and the plant. Uh, we have also have the uh, transforming agents which are complementary to all of these host cells. So, once you, once you generate a recombinant clone, you have to decide in which particular type of host system you would like to over express or you would like to express your protein because accordingly to this particular strategy, you have to select the transforming agents as well as the host cells which are going to be complementary to each other. So, what is will be the 
basis in which you are going to use the host strain because once you select the host then you can uh, automatically will have to select the transforming agent which is the vector which are going to produce the protein in these host cells. We have already discussed about the different types of vector in uh, which are available for the E. coli system, yeast system, mammalian system as well as the plant systems in our previous lectures. Uh, but the question is what would be the criteria to choose the prokaryotic versus the eukaryotic system from yeast to animals as well as the plant. Now, to criteria of selecting a expression system, there are number of factors which you need to consider for choosing a host expression vector system which will be suited for the over expression of the protein of your interest. What is the criteria? Number one criteria is the quantity of the desired protein which means whether you need the protein in uh, in a milligram microgram level or whether you need the protein in milligram or gram level because in some cases this protein could be uh, be the uh, will be the factor which you are going to use into the downstream applications for providing the nutrients for uh, or you are going to use these proteins for developing the health drinks. In those cases, the protein would be required in grams or kgs in uh, concentrations or kgs amount. Whereas, if you are simply trying to get this protein for developing the antibodies or developing the antigens or you are trying to use this protein for uh, catalyzing a particular reactions in the bioreactor as well as in the uh, some other kind of metabolic reactions which you would like to catalyze or you would like to use these for uh, transforming uh, uh, a, a ke one chemical from the toxic chemicals to the non-toxic chemicals and so on. In those cases, the requirement of these protein products may be uh, low or high. So, the quantity of the protein, desired protein is an important criteria to choose or select the expression system. If the protein what you are uh, uh, expressing is required in a very small quantities such, such as in the microgram to milligram region. In those cases, you can use any host system which is suitable for the purpose. But if the protein is required in a large quantity such as just now we have discussed if you suppose you need a protein to develop a health drink or suppose you want the protein in uh, grams level then in those cases you have to use the E. coli yeast or the baculovirus expression system which will be going to give which will be more suitable compared to the mammalian expression system simply because of the reason that the E. coli yeast or the baculo expression systems are easy to manipulate these systems are uh, cheap to grow for example if you want to use the E. coli as a source of producing your protein, then the protein is going to be the, 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 the quantity or the cost what you are going to use to uh, prepare the media or to uh, manipulate these cells is going to be much lower compared to the mammalian expression system. Same is true for the yeast as well as the baculo expression system because in some cases the protein may be of eukaryotic origin it may not over express or it may not express very well into the E. coli or the yeast system in those cases you might have to go to the baculo expression system and baculo expression system is relatively cheaper compared to the traditional mammalian expression systems. Now the second is the size of the protein. E. coli expression system or the prokaryotic expression system is not being preferred if the size of the protein is very large. For example, if you are interested to over express a protein which is of uh, 300, 500 kilodalton which is a multimeric proteins or multimeric protein complexes. For example, if you are interested to suppose over express the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex which is actually a uh, multimeric multi enzyme complexes these complexes will not going to over express uh, very optimally into the E. coli expression system in those cases you might have to use the eukaryotic system either the yeast or the mammalian expression system. 
So, if your protein is very large, the eukaryotic expression system is uh, is been uh, optimized or it been trained in such a way that it actually over expresses these kind of uh, uh, protein of large or high molecular weight. Then the third and the most important point is the compatibility between the source organism and the expression system. So, what it is mean is that in general a close distance between the source organism and the expression system is preferred as it may increase the chances of getting the expression of a cloned gene and presence of the protein in soluble fractions. So, this this means that if you are trying to over express a protein from the bacteria, then you can use the E. coli because the E. coli expression system is going to be very, very close to the bacterial expression system or suppose you want to over express a protein from the streptococcus pneumoniae or mycobacterium tuberculosis, then these protein are uh, and mycobacterium tuberculosis is very close to E. coli. So, you can use the genes which are uh, to produce the protein. Uh, so, you can use the gene from the mycobacterium to produce the protein in E. coli. But suppose you want to generate or you want to over express the actin from the rabbit, uh, then you might have to face difficulties in over expressing this kind of protein in the E. coli expression system because the distance between a bacteria and the mammalian cell, mammalian organism is very, very large. So, there are chances that these protein either may not over express or if they over express the folding system may not exist very prop, very much uh, into the E. coli system. So, because of that the E. coli may, may not either either give you the protein or if it gives you the protein, it, the protein may not be properly folded to give you any kind of the activity. So, that is why it is always been advisable that you choose the expression system as well as the source of organism which are very close. For example, in the case of rabbit, we might have to choose the yeast or the baculo expression system because these systems are much closer to the eukaryotic system or the mammalian system. Now, the third and, uh, and the fourth and the most important point is what is the downstream applications of the protein which you are going to over express. So, this is the most important because uh, the ultimate goal of the biotechnology is to over express this protein and utilize them into the downstream applications. So, once you have the idea about downstream applications, then you can choose the certain uh, you can choose the suitable sub, uh, uh, suitable expression system. For example, if the protein is uh, if if the protein is produced only for generating the antibodies or suppose your protein you are simply using for you uh, as an antigen. So, that you can detect the antibodies from the patient sera, which means you are using these proteins simply as an antigen to coat the wells and develop the ELISA bay detection kits. In those cases, it is immaterial whether the protein is active or inactive because uh, in, in, in any either of these cases, the protein uh, epitopes or the antigenic sites may not may be still be conserved because the antigenic sites of a particular protein are uh, um, present in a very, very small um, stretch. So, and these stretches may be still be intact. So, even if the protein is being over expressed and it is not present in the soluble fraction or it is not properly folded, even then the antigenic site may still be remain conserved and you can be able to use these particular type of proteins for generating the antibodies as well as using this protein as an antigen to develop the ELISA kits to diagnose a particular kind of uh, antibodies present in the patient sera. So, for those kind of applications, you can easily use any expression system, but you can use the E. coli because that E. coli expression system may give you a large quantity of proteins and as well as the manipulation as well as the cost to um, run or cost to operate the uh, E. coli expression system would be much cheaper compared to the mammalian or the yeast or the baculovirus expression system. But suppose you want to produce the protein for the activity. 
इन दोस केसेस और इन सम केसेस ऑफ सम ऑफ द प्रोटीन्स में लूज इट्स एंटीजेनिक साइट्स वेन यू आर वेन दे आर नॉट प्रॉपरली फोल्डेड बिकॉज यू वॉन्ट टू यूज दिस प्रोटीन फॉर एज एन एंटीजेंट टू डिटेक्ट द एंटीबॉडीज यूजिंग द एलाइजा इन दोज केसेज यू हैव टू यूज द होस्ट विच इज वेरी वेरी कंपेटेबल टू द प्रोटीन विच मीन्स यू हैव टू चूज द होस्ट एक्सप्रेशन सिस्टम एज वेल एज द प्रोटीन ऑफ द क्लोजर एसोसिएशन विच मीन्स इफ इट्स बैक्टीरिया यू हैव टू यूज इक्वलाई इफ इट इज अ प्रो यू कैरेटिक सिस्टम यू हैव द चॉइसिस ऑफ यूजिंग द ईस्ट बैक्यूलो और द मोमिलियन एक्सप्रेशन सिस्टम सो इन द टू डेज लेक्चर वॉट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस four different expression system such as e coli expression as an expression system we are going to use yeast as an expression system we are going to use insect cell line or the baculovirus as an expression system and at the end we are also going to use the mammalian cell as an expression system what we are going to discuss in terms of how you can uh, use the how what is the what are the features of these expression system how to Uh, uh, what are the different types of uh, vectors which are available or what are the different uh, features of these expression system and how to produce a protein which are the what are the different uh, schema uh, protocols which you can use to over express the protein in e coli yeast or mammalian expression system in the case of mammalian expression system we are also going to discuss how to de develop how to make the protein in the transient expression system or how to make the protein in the permanent expression system so let's start with the e coli as an expression system so in the case of e coli as an expression system a typical e coli uh, the different components which are present in a e coli expression system although we are discussing only in the context of e coli expression system but most of these components are mostly been present in other expression system as well so you have the following features which are in addition to the cloning vectors if you remember or recall in our previous lectures we have discussed about what are the features you required for a cloning vector in the case of cloning vector what you need you need a selection marker you need uh, the multiple cloning sites you need the replication or origin of replications which would be as per the host strain in most of the uh, prokaryotic system you have the orc whereas in the case of eukaryotic system you have the origin of replication as per the host strain uh, such as yeast or um, uh, mammalian systems and in most of the eukaryotic expression uh, used most of the eukaryotic cloning vectors you also have the origin of replication for the prokaryotic system so that you can do the cloning as well as the manipulation within the prokaryotic system and then you can transform this into the respective eukaryotic expression system and over express the protein so apart from those features those features like selection markers ncs origin of replications uh you also need the additional feature for the vector to express the protein what are these features the first and the most important feature is a promoter the promoter is a upstream sequence to the gene and it provides the docking site for the rna polymerase just now we as when we were discussing about the protein production machinery we discuss about the promoter where the rna polymerase goes and bind and then it start the transcription of the messenger rna then you need the ribosome binding site so ribosome binding site is essential because it in, it it will allow the ribosomes to go and bind and that includes the crucial chindalgano sequences which is actually going to provide the docking site for the assembly of the ribosome subunits so that the ribosome is going to assemble onto the messenger rna and then it will start the translation process the third and the uh, is also the termination sites because once you start the synthesis of transcription you have to terminate so that you are going to get the fully matured messenger rna and then at the end because you want to also facilitate the purification of that particular proteinaceous factor you also could put the affinity tags these affinity tags are important because you can use the compatible Uh, affinity beats 
and that actually will allow you to purify this protein without going through the conventional process of different types of chromatography columns. For example, if you do not have the affinity tags, you might have to use the conventional uh, chromatography techniques such as an anion exchange chromatography, cation exchange chromatography or hydrophobic interaction chromatography, child filtration chromatography. But and even after using these combinations, uh, you may end up in losing the proteins in different types of chromatography techniques. You may also going to lose the time uh, because by running these chromatography techniques you are going to waste lot of time and then at the end you also going to waste lot of chemicals. So, by putting a affinity tag whether it is the his tag or GST tag or any other affinity tags you are actually going to use a particular bead which has only affinity for this particular tag. So, tag is just like you are putting a stretch of uh, antigenic uh, region and that actually has only affinity for that particular uh, beads. So, once you pass through the whole bacterial lysate or the host lysate, your protein il will go and bind to the beads, all other protein will come out. So, because of that you could be able to achieve the better purification and in a simpler way as well as in the single step. In most of the cases you will get the uh, more than 90 percent purified protein in a single step and that actually has an advantage because it lose it, uh, it, it basically makes the efficiency of production more. Com uh, number two, it also in reduces the cost of its production because it, reduce, it reduces the wastage in terms of running the different chromatography columns. And the third is the, uh, the, the level of purity what you are going to get uh, just after the single column is going to be way more compared to using the traditional chromatography columns or traditional chromatography techniques. So, let us start with the E. coli. So, the promoter as I said in a promoter is the region which actually facilitate the binding of RNA polymerase and that is how it actually initiates the transcription and in the case of E. coli as I said the transcription and translation are uh, uh, linked to each other. So, as soon as you have the you started the synthesis of messenger RNA you are going to in, uh, also initiate the binding of ribosomes to the RNA uh, so to the messenger RNA and that is how you are going to initiate. So, that process is completely being controlled by the promoter because the promoter is going to control the transcription and so, in a typical promoter you have the two regions one is called minus 35 region the other one is called as the minus 10 region and this is your uh, side 0 where from where the messenger RNA is going to be synthesized. So, all these promoters are upstream to the RNA to the initial uh, to the start site and the minus 35 region as well as the minus 10 region is containing the different types of uh, uh, nucleotide sequences and the presence of different types of nucleotide sequences or the cassettes actually decides the strength of these promoter because if the minus 35 region as well as the minus 10 region is very strong in terms of facilitating the binding of transcription factor as well as the binding of RNA polymerase then this promoter is going to be very very strong. If these regions are going to be weak which means they do not facilitate the binding of the transcription factor as well as the binding of RNA polymerase then the promoter is not going to uh, uh, be strong which means it does not allow the uh, more rounds of RNA polymerase binding which means ultimately it is going to reduce the level of messenger RNA into the uh, particular uh, transcription after the transcription the level of messenger RNA which you are going to be produced from this particular promoter is going to be low and that is why the promoter may fall into two category the promoter which are of strong promoter where the minus 35 region as well as the minus 10 region facilitates the rapid docking of the RNA polymerase. So, since it is allowing the rapid docking it will actually uh, um, going to increase the messenger RNA level within the within the cell 
and the other category of promoter is where you are going to have the promoter of the uh, uh, weak promoters. So, in the weak promoters the minus 35 and the minus 10 regions are going to be uh, we going to will not going to facilitate the RNA polymerase binding that uh, strongly and because of that the number of cycles through which the RNA polymerase can go and bind to the promoter is going to be low and as a result the level of messenger RNA which are going to be produced from these promoter is going to be less compared to the strong promoter and consequently the, the amount of protein which you are going to produce from the uh, low uh, weak promoter is going to be less compared to the strong promoters. So, the sequence at the minus 10 and minus 34 are crucial for facilitating the RNA polymerase binding. Consequently, it determine the strength of the promoter. It could be a strong promoter or the weak promoter. And if you play with the composition of minus 35 region and minus 10 region by simply by switching the nucleotides or you are making the mutations into the promoter, you could be able to generate the strong promoter versus the weak promoter. Because of this, a number of promoters are being designed for overexpression of a protein in E. coli using a strong or the weak promoter to suit the overexpression strategies. For example, in some of the cases, it is not almost essential, almost important or essential that you use the strong promoter. In some of the cases, you all you also prefer to use the weak promoter because the advantage of weak promoter is that it actually lower down the protein productions. So, once it is lowering down the protein production, it actually giving the more time for the protein to be get folded. So, for example, suppose you are trying to overexpress a eukaryotic protein into the uh, E. coli as an expression system, then in those cases this uh, mammalian system or mammalian protein, if you produce very rapidly, the E. coli system may not be able to uh, fold this particular protein into the proper conformation. But if you reduce the uh, kinetics of the protein production, you may give the chance to the folding machinery and that may give you the uh, chance that it may get folded properly and you may get the active protein. So, in those kind of contexts, sometimes people prefer to use the weak promoter versus the strong promoter. So, based on these weak or the strong promoter, people have developed different types of vectors and that is how they have developed the different types of E. coli expression systems. So, first of, first of the uh, first uh, promoter is the IPTG inducible promoter. So, IPTG is in a synthetic analog of lactose. So, mostly the IPTG inducible promoters are actually the lactose promoter or lac operons and they are being used to induce the loc operon, the lac operon is very widely being used to construct different expression plasmid to express protein in E. coli. The different vector contains lac promoter or its derivative. One of the example is the lac promoter, example is the plasmids like PUC, PGM, etc. Then you have the TAC promoter which is called trip, trip, trip lactose promoter. It is a hybrid promoter where the minus 10 region from the lactose UV5 promoter is fused with the minus 35 region of the tryptose, uh, tryptophan promoter. Example in this case is uh, PKK223-3 which means in this case you are actually taking a minus 10 region from the lactose pr uh, lac promoter and you are taking the minus 35 promoter from the tryptophan promoter. Then the third is trick promoter. The trick promoter is the tryptophan lactose promoter. So, it is exactly the reverse of this. So, it is similar to the TAC promoter except that the distance separating minus 10 and minus 35 region of the promoter is different from the TAC promoter. Example in this case is P trick 99A. So, these are the three different types of promoter which are being derived. Uh, to uh, work as a IPTG inducible promoter and IPTG is a, uh, uh, is a chemical analog of lactose. What is the difference between the IPTG and lactose is that IPTG is non-degradable compared to the lactose which is going to be degraded by the system into the 
constituent sugars. So, if you use the lactose instead of IPTG, lactose will give you the high uh, induction in the beginning, but as the, the protein will start producing, the lactose will start degrading by the uh, bacterial machinery and as a result, you are not going to uh, get the uh, con uh, continuous uh, same level of induction throughout your induction period. Whereas, in the case of IPTG, since IPTG is non hydrolyzable uh, uh, lactose analog, it will going to induce the lac operon, but that uh, induction will remain constant from the starting of the experiment to the end of the experiment. Now, the third second uh, promoter what people use in the uh, E. coli expression system is called as the bacteriophage uh, PL promoter. This promoter keeps the tight control over the protein production. It is regulated by the presence of a repressor called uh, CLTS857 to either repress the transcription or not. CLTS857 is a temperature sensitive and it degrades at a high temperature and consequently in a temperature dependent fashion, it represses the transcription at low temperature. So, it represses the transcription at low temperature, but not at high temperature, which means the this is actually a temperature sensitive factor. So, if you increase the temperature, the factor will get de degraded and as a result, it is not going to repress. So, at low temperature you are it is going to function. So, it will going to rep rep repress the transcription, but once you in change the temperature which means like if you change the temperature from 37 to 42 that actually will going to degrade this particular uh, uh, repressor and once it is getting degraded there will be no repression or there will be no repression onto the promoter and as a result it is going to give you the protein. This promoter is useful in the cases where the protein is toxic in nature. So, what the, the, the way this particular type of unique promoter is being used is that the, if the protein is very toxic, what will happen is that if you use the IPTG based inducible promoter, it is actually going to start producing the protein because the bacteria uh, normally contains a small amount of lactose which it will take up from the media. So, as a result you are going to get the protein production uh, uh, from the beginning itself and because the protein is toxic, it is going to kill the bacteria. So, as a result what will happen is suppose you inoculated the bacteria into the media it will not let to, to, to for the bacteria to grow and reach to a certain uh, growth stage, which means it will not let you to grow uh, the bacteria to grow from the lag phase to uh, log phase and then stationary phase. It will not let the bacteria to go to the log phase because before it will get as uh, because the bacteria will be in a lag phase and in that lag phase itself the protein will be produced which is toxic and it is going to kill the bacteria. So, in to avoid that you put the gene under the control of this particular type of promoter. What will happen is you grow the bacteria at low temperature. So, that actually will going to suppress or repress the production of this particular protein. So, what will happen is that this is your typical bacterial uh, growth kinetics. Okay. So, what you do is you, uh, you, you keep the temperature low until it reaches to the log phase and once it reaches to the log phase then you what you do is you increase the temperature and even if at this stage the bacteria is going to die it hardly matters because the number of bacteria which you are going to have in the log phase is way more than the number of bacteria what you have in the lag phase and as a result the bacteria will die, but it is going to produce this particular toxic protein which you can collect later on and use it for the downstream applications. So, that is how the you can utilize or exploit the bacteriophage lambda PL based promoters. Now, you have the bacteriophage T7 promoter. So, bacteriophage T7 promoter is very, very popular in the case of E. coli as an expression vector. Sim it, is, it is similar to 
the bacteriophage promoter, uh, uh, lambda promoter, but the T7 promoter, T7 RNA polymerase is used to design plasmid with the tight control onto the protein production. These vectors contains most of the structural blocks such as the selection markers, uh, the multiple cloning sites and everything uh, from the PBR322 and the in front of the MCS you have the T7 promoter to drive the transcription of the your gene of uh, gene which you are going to use as an insert. Hence, the vector contains foreign gene in front of the TM7 promoter for expression. Now, uh, in some of the cases when you use the bacteriophage T7 promoters, you can also modify the host strain such as E. coli strain, uh, you can over express some of the protein on to the chromosome of these E. coli and that is how you can modify the host uh, to make even better tight control over the protein production. So, so, host cells also need to modify to suits to the T7 promoter expression system. Host E. coli is either transformed with the plasmid which carries the T7 RNA polymerase gene or the T7 RNA polymerase gene is integrated into the bacterial chromosome. In few host strain, T7 RNA polymerase is placed under the control of IPTG inducible LAC UV5 promoter to tightly control the production of T7 polymerase. Okay. After the induction of with IPTG, the inducer binds the LAC repressor and stimulate the production of T7 RNA polymerase using E. coli RNA polymerase. The T7 RNA polymerase binds to the T7 promoter and drive to the transcription of target gene to eventually give large amount of protein, which means uh, uh, what you are what we are trying to say is if once you in once you do the induction with IPTG, the inducer is going to bind to the lac repressor and stimulate the production of T7 RNA polymerase using the E. coli RNA polymerase. Which is once you put the uh, inducer, it will not going to, it will, it will, it will allow the E. coli RNA polymerase to go and bind to the lac promoter, and that's how into the lac promoter under the influence of lac promoter you have the T7 gene which is going to, which is going to produce the T7 RNA polymerase, and once the T7 RNA polymerase is being produced, it will go and bind to the uh, T7 promoter and that actually will going to drive the transcription of the target gene. But in some of the cases, uh, once you want to make a very tight control, so what will happen is that you are using the E. coli as an expression system and E. coli is going to have very low amount of lactose. So, even you are not adding the IPTG, which means you are not adding the inducer the lactose which is present inside the cell is going to produce or going to uh, bind to the re repressor and as a result it will going to induce the RNA polymer E. coli RNA polymerase to go and bind to the lac promoter and that is how it is going to induce the uh, first it will going to induce the production of T7 polymerase and that eventually will going to start synthesizing the uh, target gene in the absence of the inducer as well, which means if even if you do not add the IPTG, the lactose which is present inside the cell will going to function at a very, very low level uh, to produce some amount of T7 RNA polymerase and that T7 RNA polymerase will drive the production of your target gene. So, in some of the cases as just like we discussed in the bacteriophage PL lambda promoter, some of these target proteins which you are over expressing may be toxic or may not be good for the E. coli uh, growth. In those cases, you will not going to see the E. coli uh, cells number is increasing while you are inoculating. So, to make it more tight control, what people have designed is they have made two more uh, plasmids and in those plasmids what they have done is they have over expressed the T7 lysozyme gene. So, once the T7 lysozyme gene is 
going to produce the T7 lysozyme and this T7 lysozyme is going to destroy or inactivate the low level of T7 RNA polymerase which is being produced under the influence of lactose which is present inside the E. coli. So, that actually is going to destroy or going to kill the uh, background protein production in the absence of IPTG. But once you add the IPTG, the IPTG is going to be very, very strong inducible uh, indu inducers compared to the lactose, the low level of lactose which is present inside E. coli. So, as a result what will happen is a large quantity of T7 RNA polymerase is going to be produced and then you are going to see a induction once you add the IPTG. So, in the presence of these two, uh, the, these construct which contains the uh, T7 lysozyme gene, you are going to kill the background expression and that is how you can actually over express the protein which are toxic in nature in the this uh, T7 RNA, T7 promoter system as well. Now, let us discuss about how to express the gene using the E. coli expression system. So, once what are the different steps? In the step 1, you are going to produce the recombinant plasmid which is containing your foreign gene. The first step you are going to do the transformation which means you are going to deliver this particular recombinant plasmid into the bacterial system and then you are going to screen them for your transformed bacteria. So, you can use the different types of selection markers uh, depending on what, uh, what kind of uh, selection uh, marker is present on that particular recombinant plant. For example, if you, if you have the empicin uh, uh, resistant genes, you can use the transform, you can plate the cells onto a plate which contains the empicillin and in that case the uh, the, uh, the resistant uh, cells are going to grow onto the plate whereas the non-transformed colonies will going to die. So, in the first step you will do the transformation and we have discussed many methods to how to transform a host with a recombinant clone containing suitable selection markers. So, you will do the transformation as well as the selection of the transformed uh, bacteria. Then in the second step you are going to grow. So, you what you will do is you will take out a few colonies from this particular transformed colon, uh, plate. You will inoculate into the growth media. We have also discussed different types of growth media which you can use for growing the E. coli cells. Then a single colony or few colonies you uh, of transformed colony you inoculate into the suitable media. Uh, and let the uh, bacteria to go grow uh, into the log phase which is uh, in the uh, which is in the od of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 uh, we, if you remember we have also discussed how to monitor the growth of these uh, bacteria okay and you can put them into the 37 incubator with a shaking of 180 rpm now in the third step you will do the induction so what will happen is you will take out the bacterial uh, colony uh, culture, you add the IPTG, mostly people use 0 to 1 millimolar IPTG and uh, you can use the, uh, and then you put it back into the incubator at 37 with 180 RPM and you, you can optimize the time through which you can do uh, induction. So, you can uh, I, uh, I optimize the IPTG concentration as well as the time of inductions, mostly people use 3 to 6 hours induction, but this induction time can be optimized even for longer period or the higher period. Once you do the induction, the protein will start producing into these bacteria. Then you would do is you will recover the bacterial cells. So, you can recover the bacterial cells simply by centrifugations. So, that actually will give you the bacterial plates uh, with bacterial uh, uh, pellet and that bacterial pellet you can uh, lyse in the uh, with the help of SDS as well as the uh, uh, other kind of uh, detergents and then you can uh, analyze them onto the SDS page. As you can see here, you this is the control uh, bacteria which means untransformed bacteria or uninduced bacteria and this is the IPTG induced bacteria and what you will see is that we have the enhanced production of that particular protein compared to all other proteins. 
So, uh, you will see that there is a prominent expression of the target protein in the inducible cell as compared to the uninduced cells. In this video, we will show you how to induce protein expression in bacterial cells and how to analyze the uh, induction. Before that, the gene of interest which we want to express in bacterial expression system, we have to transform that construct into BL21 DE3 strain. So, BL21 cells specifically used for expression of a particular protein. Once transformed into BL21, we have to pick the single colony and inoculate in a small volume of culture. That culture we will use in scale up. So, I will show you how to inoculate, how to take single colony and uh, inoculate one colony in 5 ml of LB media and that we will use for further uh, experiments. So, this inoculation should be done in uh, laminar egg flow. So, we will use laminar hood to inoculate this colony and also we have to note that the expression if you having any uh, resistant marker like uh, ampicillin resistance a uh, kanamycin resistant you have to include that antibiotic also in your culture media so that it will uh, specifically grows our strain or uh, our strain which expresses protein rather than non-specific bacteria although it is highly impossible, impossible but we still uh, it is good to be cautious. We have uh, inoculated single colony to LB media with a suitable antibody. Now what we have to do is keep in an incubator uh, till we, we get uh, growth of 0.4 or 0.5 OD before inoculating into large culture. So I will keep these files in incubator shaker. This is the incubator shaker. So, we can actually rotate the base so that uh, uniformly the culture spread throughout the media. So, 
After we get growth, then we will inoculate into another culture that we will use for the induction analysis. You can see the bacteria, the odish is around the uh, point 37 to point 4. So this is the right time for induction. We will use isopropyl beta D thiogalactosidase uh, galactoside as a inducing agent, uh, which we call it as short, in short form we call it as IPTG. So uh, we will induce with the IPTG and also at the same time we have to add uh, antibiotic equivalent to this media so that uh, that will prevent any contamination which 
maybe accidentally uh, comes into the flask while uh, doing the induction. So this process should be carried out in uh, aseptic conditions. That is, in, that's why we will use laminar air flow for this purpose. So let's induce these samples. Then we will keep it, keep again back to the incubator shaker. Uh, this is one million, one molar IPTG. The amount of IPTG which we have to add to uh, add for induction is depends on how much expression uh, you are putting, how much expression you get. In. So you have to optimize using different concentrations of IPTG. It is uh, 0.1 million mole, 0.5 million mole, So uh, I am going to induce. After induction, we have to keep for 4 hours. Now the time is over, 4 hours is over, so uh, we have to centrifuge and get the pellet. That we will use for the uh, sonication and protein purification. see uh, the it is almost over 
so you can take out the gel then we will stain and de-stain it generally what we will do is we will uh, there are two ways of staining and de-staining process one is we can do quick staining like we have to heat it with the staining solution which contains kumasi brilliant blue and uh, along with uh, methanol and water so then we will try to de-stain with the uh, water uh, by heating but in another way the simplest simplest way is we will just uh, uh, stain the gel for 2 hours then we will de-stain overnight so i am going to show uh, the simplest way first we will stain in kumasi brilliant blue staining solution then we will de-stain in methanol water containing uh, salt so i am going to stop the uh, children then i will remove it i will show you how to remove the gel take out the last bits here we have to be very careful while taking out gel otherwise the short plates may grow on a corner we have to take and lift the gel like this so keep the gel in a staining box is more or less a plastic one but it can sustain the so then I am going to add staining solution I will keep it for a uh, rotation for on a shaker for at least two hours, then we will uh, taste it. Over. So once the time is over, after 2 hours, we will destain this solution. We kept 2 hours in staining solution. Uh, we, as we can see, the staining is uh, over. Like you can see, the gel completely turned into blue. So we remove the solution. Then I am going to add de staining solution. And I will keep this on a rocker for 2 hours for de staining. So the composition contains uh, for 100 ml of uh, de staining solution, uh, 40 ml of water, double distilled water, and 40 ml of methanol, and uh, 10 ml of. Uh, so I am going to keep uh, this on a rocker. So now it's time to document the gel. So uh, we have to identify whether we got any uh, single band fraction or not. So this is the gel I kept on uh, white tray. Now 
just close it. To summarize what we have uh, discussed so far uh, in terms of over expressing a particular foreign gene into the E. coli expression system, what you are supposed to do is you have to first transform the bacteria with a uh, recombinant uh, clone and then uh, you inoculate the single colonies into the, uh, into the uh, media and then let the bacteria to grow for the uh, log phase which is from 0.3 to 0.6 OD and then after that you recover the bacteria, lyse them and then analyze the production uh, 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 induction onto the SDS page. So, with this we would like to conclude our lecture here and in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the yeast as well as the mammalian expression system. Thank you.